Good afternoon, Geeta, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us today on her forum. It's such an honor to have you and to be able to speak with you and share your insights and your stories. It's my pleasure. Uh, it's I'm my pleasure. Even though Geeta ma'am doesn't need an introduction, I just want to say a few uh, brief words about her. Uh, Geeta ma'am is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India. She was awarded the INLAC scholarship and went on to do her LLM at Cambridge, followed by an MPhil. She has been working since 1980 and uh, has worked at the Supreme Court of India and the various high courts has worked on a number of highly impactful cases and so many pro bono cases, uh, which we will also touch upon uh, during the course of this conversation. I wanted to uh, start by asking you uh, about your journey and when you started. Um, so for, for lawyers in my generation, I feel there are of course so many men and women lawyers to look up to and specifically women lawyers who serve as role models such as yourself but I know that when you started, uh, things were very different and the number of female lawyers, uh, especially in litigation, were very less. So I actually was curious uh, to know, you know, who, who your inspiration uh, was and, and where your inspiration came from when you started. So uh, very typically, my inspiration was my father, my late father. He was an uh, extremely erudite criminal lawyer. And I've never seen anyone cross-examine the way my father did his cross-examination. He, of course, prepared thoroughly. Thoroughly means, you know, I would see him because he would do a lot of official secret act matters. Those days, those were MB custom matters and coal smuggling. You know, those were the criminal economic offenses those days uh, and coffee posa. And I would see him pour over his books, get literature from all over the world and pour over each day's cross-examination. And uh, as a small child, I can't recall what was the famous case that he was doing. And his name would be in the evening news in this one little column Virtually every day, whatever matter he had done would be in this little box. And uh, I was this adoring daughter who would cut out his, you know, do cutouts of the newspaper and make a scrapbook of all his, I mean, I, we lost it somewhere along the way. But at that time, I would love doing it and I would love hearing him and uh, over the years and so it was about the age of seven I decided I have to be a lawyer. So that was a long time ago and my father of course couldn't find it acceptable because there were no women lawyers and as we went along there were one or two women lawyers but they did not build any reputation for themselves which was really so exceptional. So my father thought that I was this gold medalist topping all along the way, Lady Sri Ram and um, uh, law faculty. I came second in university in both. And this with my sports and my extracurricular. So it was a decent record. And my father said, well, you're so good at everything. Why don't you do the IES? And I said, no. I mean, I'm not interested. I'm just interested in law. He said, but in this profession, women don't do well. And I said, uh, I don't care. I just have to do law. My mother, of course, was very supportive. She had this dream that one of her daughters would be a lawyer and one would be a doctor. And she had her way. <laughs> and uh, my sister is a pediatric surgeon and... I'm a lawyer. Of course, my brother's a lawyer. But for boys, it's an easier path because, you know, that is not as tough as trying to break glass ceilings and try and do law. For example, when I wanted to go to Cambridge also, my father was not feeling confident. We led this very protected, shielded life 
he was this, uh, he would be on the sports field with me i was playing hockey for delhi and he both my parents were sportsmen and my father would pro- come down from the high court and from patella house and watch me in the national stadium playing hockey so and i used to play for the state he would uh, be very encouraging but for him my going abroad to study was not something that he found that easily palatable even though he was very proud of me he was very protective as all fathers tend to be but um, he was essentially my inspiration over the years you get inspired by great um, uh and we would have wonderful debates on our dining table on uh, my mother was an academician she had taught in lady of in college and then given up everything to look after bringing all her brats up but um, both all the time we would have very interesting conversations very political very human rights very you know intense and uh, my father would have lots of people over who would discuss this so it was i uh, and he had leaders from all views from every political party uh, dropping in who he would be defending he was always defending the underdog so whoever was out of power was the person that he would be defending so uh, great sense of admiration great sense of fighting for justice and uh, for human rights and uh, all that so i i think that's really my inspiration that's amazing uh, and uh, clearly ma'am you had so much inspiration at home that you didn't really have to uh, look out um i also wanted to speak about how um uh, so the reason we i i thought of starting her forum and, and the whole ethos of of this platform and community is that i think collaboration and networking and having conversations um just facilitates so much growth and and of course healthy competition is beneficial but i don't think that this whole um narrative around women competing with each other or, or even just anybody competing with each other um i i think sometimes it's blown out of proportion so i wanted to actually ask you to touch upon your relationship um with another senior advocate uh, a woman lawyer who who you have been working with since the beginning of your career and you both have uh, you know uh, been partners and have have grown and now have uh, illustrious car- careers and i wanted to ask you how in that case uh, the collaboration really benefited you in your career and the woman i'm talking about is um mrs pinky anand uh so if you could share with us a little bit about your collaboration and how your friendship uh, personally and professionally with uh, mrs anand helped you out so um pinky was more keen to do mba we were both together in school from kindergarten presentation convent and then we were both in lady shyam college she took economics i took law we both topped our colleges in our in both the both our subjects um, i in political science she in economics and uh, then we went on to law faculty in the meantime pinky and i were good friends and we would be fighting with each other whether we should go in for law or for mba so i was keener on law and she was keener on manage business management and um we gave the xlri exam i talked and she probably came 17th or something she chose to join xlri and i chose to join the faculty of law and then one fine day she called me from xlri there was a little difficulty even in those days even in management it was not many women she was the only i mean we were two women who got admission to that year's xlri mba course uh, 
she was the only woman to join so it was not easy for her in the whole class she was the only girl and she came back from jamshedpur to join law and then we both um, decided we have to work together so she, i came went to cambridge she went to harvard and i did two degrees and she did the llm and she worked at harvard for a bit and then we came back and we practiced for a good 30 years together so now <laughs> the it was fun so it's a question you have to do a lot of give and take to have a partner you have to have complete probity and you have to have complete sense of integrity because otherwise it's built on trust and uh, in that sense both of us trusted each other fully was it good i think it stood us in great uh, because we both enjoyed our work and when you have a problem if there's somebody you trust and you don't think it's competitive with that person that you can actually let your shackles down and ask them hey i don't understand this do you can you suggest what how i should go about this and what do you think is the solution and we always had although we from day one i didn't work with my father he was there as a mentor in fact he was known as the mentor of thousands of young people or older people who would go to ask him for advice and i would see him patiently explaining to everyone so whenever there was a problem we had him to go get you know to go to but the great sense is of collaboration and not competition because you work together you i'm sure there must have been a sense of competition at some level but there was a healthy competition because initially we both got the in lads but initially when we called up the scholarship and we said what's the news we were told there's some good news and bad news geeta's got the scholarship and pinky you haven't and later they turned around to pinky and they said if she had admission to a us college they would give her the scholarship for that place even though it would be a first for the index so she got admission to cornell and to harvard and so she also got the scholarship but obviously there's a competition because if all those years they had only had one lawyer and you know you were competing and even when we came to law faculty we were the two competitors who had to get the merit scholarship there was another scholarship which was a merit come means and there again we were competitors so there has to be a sense to excel there has to be a sense of competition to collaborate there has to be a sense of trust and the competition has to be healthy so uh, it's um, it has been a lot of fun this whole journey has been fun because she's been there and uh, we've had each other and of course um it's really you, you also take your disappointments much easier if you have someone to share it with so it's really sharing and not getting angst about someone feeling that someone may do better so um i i feel that um, in the competitive world i'm very happy to see now i'm part of a uh, world um, an international uh, group which is doing crime which is a women's group i have recently been 
uh, invited to some fora where women are trying to help each other in arbitration to get a place in arbitration. So you are seeing this slowly emerge after 40 years or 30 years, 35 years of practice that women are trying to help each other. But traditionally, the few exceptional women, people didn't try and help each other. And I think uh, helping each other, you may help someone to do well, but that itself is success. Yes, that's so true. And I think the way both of your careers have charted out is great evidence of, of how that is true. I, um, moving on, wanted to uh, talk about, uh, you know, your pro bono work. And um, I, I know that you take up uh, a number of uh, pro bono cases and, do a, uh, and a lot of PILs. I was talking to a, another woman lawyer recently who's worked extensively with you and she told me about how you have, um, you were working on this case for seven or eight years um, to get a man out of prison who was wrongfully imprisoned. And, uh, you know, what, you won the case. And of course, for his family, it was almost like you were a god. And I guess this is a superpower that lawyers do have, especially in this context, to be able to change people's lives. Um, so I, I wanted to, um, you know, coming back to my question, I wanted to ask you, when in your career did you uh, start taking up pro bono work? And, and, uh, and is it something which you do on a case to case basis? Or um, is there just a certain amount of your work now that is a certain percentage of it that is pro bono? So uh, when I returned to India, in fact, my mother was a follower of the Sivananda Ashram in Rishikesh and she would like going there. One of the things that I saw was that you have to give a certain portion of your income and earnings uh, to charity. I think it was 30%, I don't recall. And I said, I don't even have that much. You know, I don't have enough to have fuel. I don't, because you know, lawyers in at our time, as we were given a stipend of some 300 or 330 or 350. So you hardly earned very much, you, you knew. So I said, how do I give back to society? So I did two things. I started doing legal aid work for the hard jail prisoners, particularly women and juveniles. And I also joined and formed a legal aid center for Manushi. And we would do this Tuesdays, Fridays and do some work. But more on the Tehar jail front, whoever was having trouble couldn't have anybody. And then my legal aid, the legal aid uh, uh, clinic uh, or Delhi Legal Aid Center, which was in Patiala House at that time, which was just a baby thing. Now it's become this enormous, gigantic, uh, you know, center, but at that time there were hardly any volunteers, and I would go and uh, work a lot with uh, legal aid. So much so that when my daughter was born, I saw that 80% of my work was pro bono, and she was just a baby born. So at that time, I thought that I would restrict it slightly during her. Uh, her baby years so that I would reduce it to some extent so that I could give her a little time. And uh, over the years now it's become case to case that if you think that somebody needs help, then you just pitch him to help that person. And this case that the other lawyer was talking about, I don't remember. But there are many interesting cases where one has tried to help. So this is, um, I think, uh, helping somebody get us get justice is its own reward. Um, and so happy that my daughter Shivani has the same gene, and so she is doing many 
pro bono rape, murder, poxo cases where she feels people are wrongly accused. She's doing the trials and she's doing them very beautifully. Ma'am, switching course a little bit, uh, you have um, spoken a lot about this subject and, and the field of law that you're in. Uh, very often you're dealt with a scenario where um, very easily cases become uh, social media trials. And of course, there are so many opinions out there in the media about it. Um, you have spoken about the importance of, of having a fair trial and, and how it should not become a social media trial. I, I wanted to know if how this impacts you when you're working on a case and what you think is the way forward. You're absolutely right. Uh, this has been a major concern for me. And uh, so I've spoken widely on media trials. Uh, of course, to no effect, because the moment a person is a public figure, in India, there are no holds barred, and the press tries to report them. I think one of the thing, uh, aspects that we as lawyers can do is that if it's about a case that we are doing, and I'm saying there will be exceptions. There can't be, it can't be a rule. But if it's a matter that you are doing, then one should try and not be opining all the time about it, because then you are adding to the same media trial. So while it's subjudice, it's best to let others comment on it rather than yourself entering the field. Now, from the point of view of the accused or the victim, I feel um, it's extremely unfair for retrying the person because our judges are human. In fact, there's been a great, great debate on this. Are judges human enough that they will get affected by media or are they in ivory chambers where um, media reporting will not affect them? And um, I say, for example, in that Indrani's case, you know, that case where her daughter has disappeared and she's being tried. I'm not involved with the case, so I can speak about it very easily. So Indrani Mukherjee and Peter Mukherjee's case, it became such a media trial. Uh, and uh, to some extent, there were people who were crying for his blood, even though it wasn't clear that he was involved. Whatever may be the gory facts of any case, one has to have some restraint and media has to learn to self-restraint. But since one newspaper or one, uh, you know, uh, one channel may be reporting, the other channel doesn't want to be left behind because this is juicy news. It's newsworthy. It will get to TRPs and so on. So everybody starts reporting more and more facts. Um, or even in that uh, case of that Arushi murder case, you know, the facts are that media so much takes over a case that the actual trial and the judges get complete, can get completely confused and scared to do what is their job to do. Of course, they can get scared even if they have somebody under the Gunda Act, Gangster Act, and they may say, okay, let me, you know, should I be giving bail when this person has so many cases or should I not be giving bail and would my life be in danger? I mean, a judge is a human being. He need, but there have to be norms and Supreme Court has laid down the norms. Many cases, there's PUCL versus State of Maharashtra in Nirbhai's case with that um, India's daughter that 
uh, there was a movie and the court said, let it not be released till the trial and till everything is over. That was Justice Badar Ahmed's, I think Justice Sanjeev Deva's bench. So there have been repeated pronouncements by Supreme Court. Then the other issue is gag orders. The moment there's a gag order, the lawyers are up in arms, the press is up in arms, this person's got a gag order. How can they be stopping freedom of speech and expression? And in the and now with social media, it's so strong that the US, which believed that freedom of speech and expression should not be curtailed at all. After I think OJ Simpson trial and that there was another famous trial, I'm forgetting the name, uh, where a lady was accused of murdering her child and then later acquitted, although she was acquitted. Fact is it became totally a media trial that the US is thinking of bringing in parameters for the press. So uh, the United Kingdom has been more circumscript, uh, mostly saying the moment a matter is sub judice, then the reporting should be just actual reporting rather than juicy this side, that side, right, wrong report. India, we've not had these parameters. The courts have said it uh, a couple of times, but nobody has really gagged, said, you know, anything to the press, you cannot do this. So I think it's time our press did some self-restraint. Otherwise, we'll be sending some innocent people to the gallows. And I think that's really very scary. That is very true. And uh, I think the, I mean, we need to work towards being able to build an ecosystem where, of course, uh, having a fair trial as well as uh, freedom of speech can coexist. But I think it seems like we're still far from reaching there. Uh, I wanted to also um, speak about um, certain cases you've done. Um, Ma'am, you've um, done a number of really um, uh, you know, uh, a number of cases that have had a lot of scrutiny. Um, there have been cases involving um, people who've been accused of sexual harassment, like the Tarun Tejpal case and the MJ, MJ Akbar case that you've worked on. And um, there's often a lot of backlash um, when you take up such cases. Um, so I wanted to ask you, and, and this is probably a dilemma that a lot of lawyers face, is, um, you know, the sometimes a case that you take up may not align with your moral principles. Um, but you have spoken widely about your duty as, as a lawyer to, to give everyone uh, everyone's right to a fair trial. So I wanted to um, understand you know, how you reconcile the two things um, when you are uh, faced with such a scenario of taking up such a case and how you've done it in the past. See, I think, firstly, um, Uh, I don't want to comment on cases because, as I said, I normally don't comment. Both cases are subjudice, so it's not fair to comment on them. But, you know, everyone is entitled to a good name and to respect. You build your reputation over 40, 50 years. And every day of building your reputation as a professional takes a lot of effort and hard work. Everyone's entitled to a trial. So it's very easy to malign that reputation, particularly in today's social media world. And I'm not talking of any case, because as I said, on subjudice cases, it would not be right to, risk, uh, to comment. But, and so one of the questions that someone was asking was, do you think criminal defamation should continue in this country? And to my mind, we don't have a good civil defamation law in the sense that 
India's tortious liability is very poor. You don't really compensate a person properly. You take 10 years or 20 years to compensate by which time their reputation's been harmed. You see so many cases where people have been maligned and later the person's taken back their statement, but that doesn't get back their reputation. So there has to be a right of defense to any person. And one can't bring more your own sense of morality or uh, into it because you yourself have to see through a trial what is right or wrong. So it is only the trial and the judge that will determine whether it's right or wrong. So um, very early in my profession, I as a woman had thought I would never, never take up a rape case. And uh, that really bothered me. And the first few years of my profession, I had got these cases where I remember this poor tailor who'd been wrongly accused. But I said, no, I've decided I'm not going to take a rape case. I'm not going to help or defend him. And finally, the Supreme Court in that case, I passed it on to a colleague. I didn't want to touch it. Finally, the Supreme Court came down heavily on the complainant who had clearly made a wrong complaint and it bore out by evidence which was collected during, uh, at some point, and he was granted bail. But in the meantime, of course, his reputation was harmed. And of course, I didn't defend him because I thought I couldn't defend any such case. But I think that's wrong. You have to, if you believe in something, you have to do that. And uh, also, everybody's entitled to a fair trial. Right. And uh, ma'am, also, you know, speaking about the, the courts, um, I think something I've been reading about and a point I wanted to discuss with you is um, there have, there's been a, a large decline in dissenting opinions from our Supreme Court. And uh, this is quite surprising for a common law country. So I was, I was wondering if you could weigh in on this and, and uh, share on why you think that this may have come about, this situation. This is something which is very interesting, which you are pointing out. And I had not thought about it till you asked this question. But you are very right. Uh, we need, so there, there will be issues where you possibly can't dissent. For example, decriminalizing adultery or some of the constitutional law judgments which have come out recently, they've all been, um, or 377, decriminalizing 377, where it's consensual among two adults of whichever gender. So there are rights of transgender. So there are aspects where you hope that there would be no dissent. There still is possibility of dissent, but you hope there won't be a possibility. So there's been this ethos. But uh, on other issues like data protection, or some aspects of right to privacy, or some aspects of Adhar. You may agree, disagree, but it would be interesting to have some dissenting opinions, but it's mostly concurring, but little different opinions. Um, I feel that maybe over a period of time, a lot of aspects of our constitution have got laid down. And therefore, various aspects have been overturned, like right to privacy, or, you know, there are various judgments that have changed the earlier law. But 
you are right there should be dissenting opinions the court should be formed of people of all hues um, and you see that a lot in the us uh, where there will be this strong opinion of the majority and a strong opinion by the minority um, maybe by and large we are becoming more progressive i don't know i think uh, a difference of opinion shows a more thinking people Healthy and that's what is important right so that's very healthy so it's actually issue by issue so we have to examine the issue and saying see whether there could have been a difference of opinion or would there be need for a healthy difference of opinion i think it has to be case by case because there are many aspects as time goes on that views have to change yes that's that's correct and and i guess it's it's much harder to speak about it in a broader context it it would depend on a case to case basis but uh, wrapping up i i wanted to to lastly ask you um the the field of law that you work in and, and the way your your career is um you know the stakes are so high and there's so much pressure there's a lot of media scrutiny um but and and the working hours but but you also of course um, have a family life and and so i was wondering um you know how do you how do you manage uh, things when the stakes are so high do you have you learned to sort of compartmentalize the different aspects of your life so i think this is a question which is more appropriate to ask my family because they might just say that no she doesn't compartmentalize i wish she did <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, honestly speaking it's very great you need a very supportive family um my mother's been and my siblings have all been very supportive in helping me bring up my daughter um and she's turned out to be a fine young lady and a lawyer so my husband's been he's a astrophysicist and he's supportive i think you it it makes you at a sense of peace if you have a supportive family because all said and done a working woman in a profession like law has to do a lot of sacrifice so one of my sacrifices which i did when shivani was growing up was i made it a point i would not go for dinners or any socializing except with my parental family or my husband's family i mean except with family of very close friends i thought that this is the least that i owed her so you have to make you know you have to make choices and uh and you have to the family has to sacrifice a bit maybe you don't sacrifice so much you also sacrifice so you are right it's a balancing act as long as you feel that you balanced it right and at the end of the day you say no if i ran my i by had my life all over again i would do it a different way and i think perhaps i won't do it a different way so i can only say i'm happy that is amazing uh i i'm just going to end now um by 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 quoting you actually uh once uh, when someone asked you about um what advice you would have for women lawyers you said that you know don't uh, worry about being a woman lawyer just uh, be a, a great lawyer um and i think that is so simple but uh, but so nice and so profound um so thank you so much for for coming here today and speaking with me uh, this was so nice and uh, i'm sure a lot of people watching are going to really appreciate it thank you so much thank you it's a pleasure thank you